but I think let's uh, let's dive in and get started, and then I'm trusting that we will have uh, we'll have a full house uh, by the time we get through the introduction, the sort of get to the introduction point and dive into the conversation. Um, So this panel is Unlocking CDFIs as an Emergency Response System for Communities and People of Color. Uh, I'm Tim Freundlich, Founder and Executive Director of Strategic Development at Impact Assets, uh, which is a $1.2 billion donor advised fund and impact investment complex that just marked its 10th year, yay. I'll be joined in the discussion, hopefully by Greg Johnson from Rockefeller Foundation, uh, we're waiting on him, Beth Bafford from Calvert Impact Capital, uh, who I saw it pop up on the screen, Michael Lithcott from Obsidian Investment Partners and Kat Berman uh, from CNO. And they'll all each do a short introduction in just a couple of minutes. So I'm gonna leave that to them. Uh, but it's worth noting up front that our organizations have collectively placed more than $1 billion in CDFIs. I was adding up, the, doing the math, uh, building to that level and revolving in multiples, of course, because it comes in and goes out and comes in and goes out over the years. Uh, and this is a great selection of people developing new models to get more and better uh, and faster capital through CDFIs to those most excluded in the system and hit hardest by the pandemic. And that's kind of the framing for this, this panel. Um, but we wanted to start with just a really quick CDFI 101 because um, I was remembering last night, uh, back to 1999 when I was still at Calvary Impact Capital, that not everybody knows what CDFIs are, uh, those being community development financial institutions. And in 1999, Microsoft certainly didn't know when, uh, when words spell check helped me send a proposal to an unnamed major foundation with 33 instances of CDFIs replaced with the word codfish. And that did not help our application, needless to say. Um, I can't remember if we got the grant now that I think about it. But, um, but let's go to a couple slides here quick. And thank you, Beth and Calvary Impact Capital for providing these, which saved me having to make stuff up. Uh, there you go. If you double click on that, I think you'll see uh, them expand and come kind of front and center uh, for you. I uh, would suggest doing that. But uh, uh, just a housekeeping note, if you want throughout, just please feel free to chat into the session tab. Uh, any questions that come up, uh, obvious comments, posts, link, anything you want. Uh, and we'll try to bundle those and pull them in a little bit more towards the latter part of the session. Um, and we'll see how that goes. It's kind of trouble multitasking. If you see me frantically looking around, it's because I'm trying to uh, ca uh, capture that feed. But if you look at CDFIs as an industry, they're, I mean, it's pretty amazing, $222 billion. Um, across 1,100 institutions. Uh, CDFIs were set up as a designation um, with the CDFI fund in 1994 in the Department of the Treasury, just a little factoid there, but 1,100 certified revolving loan funds, real estate development corporation, banks, credit unions, all serving low to moderate income populations with an emphasis on those locked out of access to capital from the mainstream. Now, 222 billion, you look at JP Morgan Chase, two trillion, it's a drop in the bucket on the one hand, but CDFIs matter far more than their relative side, especially in our conversation right now about reaching communities and people of color with a new wave of capital to enable economic recovery uh, and to increase racial justice. Uh, that's really kind of the punchline here. And CDFIs are funded by impact investors all across the country, PRIs from foundations like Rockefeller, donor advised funds like Impact Assets, often coursing through intermediaries like Calvary Impact Capital and CNOTE, uh, and structures organized by groups like Obsidian Investment Partners. So there's like a whole system here. And then add to that uh, bank CRA money and treasury CDFI fund, which kind of fills out the picture. Uh, and that's what we're gonna be talking about today in just a couple of minutes. And um, if you look at the second slide here, I can advance them. There you go. Um, you know, there's been studies done. I know that the opportunity finding, I've actually seen this study, Beth, um, in 2015, kind of the 20th anniversary study of the formation of CDFIs, 1.5 million units of housing had been supported um, during that period of time. 120,000 small business funded it, funded. Um, 
10,000 community service organizations. I mean, it's just, you know, amazing grassroots impact that CFIs have done. This is a few years ago. I mean, CFI scale has really grown since then, both with new CFIs being minted, new banks signing on, uh, but also just increased growth. On average, 75% of CDFIs serve low-income uh, populations with about roughly half women and half non-white. So pretty, pretty important kind of impact footprint all with 1.5% default rates, roughly equivalent to FDIC insured banking institutions. So it's not like high risk stuff. Uh, and while banks were recoiling in and after the great recession, CDFIs leaned in and actually grew their lending in communities. Uh, I, I think that's, that sort of tells the story that we need to really uh, ground ourselves in. And even more recently, the first round of the CARES Act stimulus wasn't really getting to where it needed to go. Second round kind of also really problematic in a lot of ways, there's been a lot of critique about it, but when CDFIs finally got their $7.5 billion allotment of the PPP money, they got it out like so fast and so much like, to the core, the core, core of, um, of communities and funded more than 100,000 businesses in like a hot CDFI minute, I like to think of it, uh, of just amazing, amazing deployment. So, uh, you know, CDFIs rock, they've rocked for a long time, but the system is on the rocks um, to an extent. And the system needs innovation, not just incrementally more of the same, you know, going from 200 to 250 billion to 300 billion, um, not even multiples maybe of the same. And I think we're gonna hear this from the panelists about, you know, sort of what their version of not the same is, uh, what the kind of call to action and audacity needs to be, but the regulating banking system obviously can't get it done. Even the CDFI banks and credit unions are so deeply constrained on taking on risk. But the problem is these frontline community development corps and uh, revolving loan funds are, are woefully undercapitalized. Uh, they're, they're mostly stuck in nonprofit structures, which I love nonprofits. Impact Assets is a nonprofit, nothing wrong with nonprofits, but they can't really raise equity technically, equity investment that being. They, they have to build equity through grants, not that scalable. They operate on very thin margins, leading to underinvestment uh, in better processes and technologies, automation. They are um, they really aren't capitalized in a way that can lean. I, I feel can lean into the need uh, that is presented, in particular in the in this time and what we're going to see over the next years. Um, and it's it's just not worthy of this amazing system that's been built and that we've actually lent the mandate to to, to do this great work on the front lines of communities um, and people of color around the country and and just throughout throughout um, throughout society here. The next um, so that's at any rate that's a little bit of just background and kind of framing. Uh, that was a bit of a rant, but I I you know I get kind of uh, energized by by this topic. I want to do a lightning round with the other panelists just you know the who the who the what you know where, where you're coming from not not your framing point of view but just a quick introduction from each of you would be awesome uh greg why don't we go greg beth michael cat like a minute or so if you could just dive in greg sure good afternoon everyone and thanks excited to share this time and this space with such an outstanding group of people. My name is Greg Johnson. I'm Director of Place-Based Grant Making and Investments at the Rockefeller Foundation on the Equity and Economic Opportunity Team. By way of introduction, at the Rockefeller Foundation, we are quite busy fighting for vulnerable families who have been locked out of prosperity at home and around the world, making sure that innovation empowers all people to rise. In the U.S., our work has been focused on building economic stability for America's low wage workers using the levers of public policy and private investment to get the job done. Over. Awesome. Great. Over. My name is Michael Woodcott. I am um, just honored to be on this uh, panel of, of friends and um, to be speaking at SOCAP, which is probably one of the bravest places for, for capitalists and people that believe in. Um, uh, Alternative systems for financing and economic justice. Worked out and disenfranchised for so long. So thank you. Um, I'm one of the founding partners uh, at Obsidian Investment Partners. Um, firm's three years old. I, I don't do a lot of panels. Usually Van Jones, who's our other founding partner, uh, does most of the the panels for, for us. But um, you know he's busy trying to make sure that the election comes up the right way. So so you guys got me. <laughs> um, 
We are a, a real asset fund focused on tax advantage strategies, primarily uh, trying to move capital at scale, so billion dollars plus, um, specifically to uh, nonprofits and CDFIs. Wonderful. Uh, Kat, I noticed we lost Beth. Beth's uh, computer is freaking out when she's trying to get back in, but mm -hmm. we'll, we'll just let her do her intro when she gets here. But Kat, go ahead. Certainly, certainly. Well, again, thanks, Tim, for, for asking us to join. And I'm, I'm happy to be on with such a great group of, of speakers um, and thought leaders. Uh, my name is Kat Berman. I am co-founder and CEO of CNOTE. So CNOTE is a women-led impact investment platform on a mission to use financial innovation to close the wealth gap, which I would call a wealth chasm at this point um, throughout the United States. Uh, for us, it's very important to use the power of technology to really advance this field. We've been bullish on CDFIs for years and me personally for over 15 years, um, understanding what an incredible opportunity for both impact and investment CDFIs are. Um, we are excited to use the power of technology to make it easier for investors of all sizes to identify, underwrite, and invest in this incredible industry called CDFIs. Great. Um, sorry, I was just trying to, to figure out how to get Beth back in off to this side there. Um, okay, well, we will grab her when she arrives and have her break in with, uh, with an introduction, but why don't we do a bit of a round robin now? And Greg, we're starting with you. Um, the, the idea of kind of like framing how you come to this work, how you come to this system too, and, and think about it, kind of the big issues that we need to be cognizant of, sort of what wake, gets you up in the morning, what, but more, more like what keeps you up at night, um, perhaps, and, and kind of just give us a, a, a couple minutes each on sort of what your, what your framing is, and you can riff off of anything I said or just go off in a completely different direction, totally fine. You may not want to give me such a broad license, Tim. Uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll never get back to where we intended to go. Uh, but, but no, 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 no. Thank you for the question. I think that the pandemic, uh, I know that the pandemic has triggered um, and exacerbated multiple crises and catastrophic effects um, on health, on wealth, and the overall well-being of Black and Native and Latinx communities across the country. And to be clear, and it's not an understatement, those Black and Native and Latinx communities, the people and places um, are experiencing an emergency. And I think that it's important to further distinguish that it is not an emergency for Black and Latinx and Native people, but it is a national emergency that is disproportionately affecting Black and Native and Latinx people in places. So um, if we can understand that context and in the context of a national emergency that disproportionately affects Black and Latinx and Native communities, uh, in the context of a national emergency where nearly half of all Americans would have trouble paying a $250 unexpected expense as of October 2020 in the context of a national emergency where the number of small businesses uh, in the U.S. have declined by more than 2.2 million between February and May, with Black-owned businesses being especially hard hit. Uh, in a national emergency where Black and Latinx and Native means that you have a higher chance of contracting the virus because you work in an essential industry, you run an essential business, um, you live in a housing situation that is more close to people, more uh, closely approximated to people, um, that you have a higher chance of contracting the virus and a lower chance of receiving care. And even if you receive queer care, you, you'll probably receive a lesser standard of care um, than anyone else who receives care. So in the context of all those things and a national emergency, I think it's fair to suggest that we should focus the national response on those communities and those places that are disproportionately feeling the impact or the affect of what's happening right now. And right now, there are consumer and small business needs that I just kind of highlighted in Black and Latinx and Native communities. Um, and I think that CDFIs have demonstrated that they can can be a critical element on the front line of providing an emergency response by doing things like restructuring the terms of current financing, uh, providing access to new types of capital. They can serve as a channel to access government support like PPP, which for Black and Latinx people
people was not the most successful, but we saw some examples like ACE, which is a small business lending, CDFI in Georgia, who in the wake of the pandemic connected with all of their existing customers and where they needed to, they restructured their financing. They also helped their clients access PPP uh, loans from others and originated PPP loans directly when the SBA opened up the process to CDFIs. I'm using ACE as an example, but ACE is not the only one. In cities across the country, organizations like the Black Business Investment Fund, um, the Opportunity Fund, and others are meeting the meeting some of the emergency needs of entrepreneurs and of people of color. So wrapping up here because you only gave me four minutes. So it's important to strengthen uh, CDFIs, Tim, and to build on their good work. And I think that with the right innovations, the right innovations, and that's why I'm so happy C-Note and others are here today, um, CDFIs can be focused on purposefully, uh, on purposeful financial, becoming purposeful financial intermediaries who make a real impact in Black and Latinx and Native communities and, and for borrowers of color. I'll just add this because, you know, this is my my point of view is that at the same time, while CDFIs are necessary, acknowledging that they are a necessary part of what has to be in place and strengthened to get us from where we are to where we need and want to be, is that I'm also acknowledging that in their current state, they are not sufficient. So I do believe that in tandem with the good work being done by CDFIs, that we need to accelerate the development and scaling of new financial mechanism and investment models to better meet the needs of people uh, and the places where they live. So that's the path that we've chosen at the Rockefeller Foundation. Our emerging ROC portfolio will focus on strengthening the community of CDFIs who best serve the needs and interests of Black, Latinx, and Native communities and supporting the alternative structures as necessary to respond to the national emergency, the national emergency that is disproportionately affecting Black, Native, and Latinx communities. Over. Kat, why don't you jump in and, and give us your perspective? Absolutely. Um, I mean, I think for two, two points, number one is I think most of us on this uh, webinar understand that that communities of color are being disproportionately affected by pandemic, right? I'm not telling you anything new. I think what most folks may not know, though, is the funding levels that would be needed to actually address that has not been met. And while many of us are sitting there with some pockets that we can distribute, we've absolutely not seen that adequately addressed. And so I think what we're excited to talk about are what are the opportunities blatant, overt, and direct about where we put our sources of capital right now. Um, I will share at C-Note, we believe it's not enough to fund CDFIs broadly. Uh, we're at a time that it is critical that we acknowledge that certain communities are being hit much, much harder, and not only funding those communities, but communities. And so we advocate strongly both podium, but also through our investments, making sure that there is funding going to CDFIs led specifically by people of color, smaller CDFIs, CDFIs that are hit in the hard hit communities that maybe have never received a, a dollar of CRA funding in their life, but are doing that critical work. We know that's hard to do. We know that over the years, there's been plenty of reasons why not. Everything from underwriting so expensive, they can't take enough capital, how do I even identify them? And I'm happy to say, you know, in 2020, we have, <laughs> we have been able to address most of those pieces of friction. And so, whether it's a foundation that wants to double down on their work with racial justice or place-based investing, whether it's a bank that is excited to look at new ways to deploy their CRA, um, whether it's a family office or other institutions that want to step into CDFIs for the first time. We're more advanced than we've ever been across the country to say, great, I care about this. I care about how communities of color are being affected right now, and I want to invest in them thoughtfully intentionally and a way that's strengthening that community, not just a flyby, you know, drop of a grant or drop of an investment that is not really building up the leadership in that community. So I think, you know, we're strong advocates uh, of the CDFI industry as a whole and, and what they can do and how they continue to step in right now at such a critical time in our economy as, as economic first responders but also acknowledging that we cannot fund CDFIs the way they've been funded traditionally over the last 30 plus years. We, now is the time to pull, up, pull back the curtain, recognize that smaller CDFIs and specifically Black-led, Latin, Latinx-led, Native-led CDFIs deserve funding, need the funding, and it's time for us to step in. Yeah. 
Yes, yes, plus five. Um, <laughs> Michael, go ahead. Hi, Pat. You're muted. Still muted. Hey, Michael, you're muted. Sorry, uh, working with CDFIs directly on the ground. We focus on the other end of the spectrum. We focus with the large family offices, institutions. Our, our clients are top 50 uh, high net worth families, ultra high net worth families in the country um, across both sides of the aisle who really want to address the fact that we have problems that are growing in scale in the trillions. Right? We've, we've hit hundreds of billions of dollars in terms of need for housing. We've hit hundreds of billions of dollars in terms of the need for economic justice and racial justice equality. And the solutions that we're putting out now are really in the millions of dollars or sometimes in the thousands of dollars. So when you talk about CDFIs, these smaller institutions, when you listen to other talks at SOCAP, you really hear the kinds of numbers people are deploying. Philanthropy alone by itself is not even nearly big enough on an annual basis to address the problem. So the question is, a low interest rate environment like we have now, where there are plenty of people investing in things on a market rate basis that are less than 2% return, how do we, and that's in the tens of trillions of dollars, how can we create capital solutions that allow CDFIs and others to access market rate low cost capital? So, uh, and that's fundamentally different, I think, than other approaches that try to take risk capital and, and ask people to take a discount on that. And we are primarily focusing that lower cost capital on CDFIs and nonprofits. So in our view, by the larger CDFIs, we can create a more healthy ecosystem that will allow all CDFIs and, um, and um, MDIs and nonprofits to grow the pie. So, um, you know, for us, it's really important that the funding community and others start talking about this problem at the scale at which it exists, which is really hundreds of billions of dollars. And, um, you know, plenty of people are complaining about their 2% capital. We'd like to see more of that um, come to the people in the work that is so critical. Great, Michael. Yay, Beth, you vanquished your computer um, and got it in line. Um, First, make sure you take a minute and introduce yourself and kind of where you're coming from. And then the question or the, the sort of the prompt for everybody is that we were just going around, uh, what it was really just to amplify or in, inject your point of view and, and, and Calvary Impact Capitals into the sort of the state of play in CDFIs and the system, kind of how you approach it, uh, what's keeping you up at night, uh, but any other comments you want to layer in. No, thank you. And um, uh, hi, everyone. It's Beth Bafford. Uh, I work at Calvert Impact Capital. Uh, we're a, a 20 uh, in two days. Um, so uh, our 25 year anniversary is in, in uh, October 25th. Uh, Tim, you'll probably remember this. Uh, uh, in in 90, 1996, five, when we sold our first note. Um, and we are a global financial institution investing in uh, community and economic development in the U.S. and around the world. Um, so, you know, this this conversation is so important, and I think of the threads that I was able to catch uh, uh, at the end of, of CAD and, and Michael's uh, talks, I think really come together um, nicely because I think the what, what we see is basically that how do we better tie the work of CDFIs and the work that has been done for so long with the so much closer to this broader conversation around stakeholder capitalism and investor activism and uh, and thinking about uh, the whole economy and the whole planet um, as consumers and investors. Things are very linked, very linked. often don't, uh, th those ecosystems often don't overlap. And so I think that's one of the things that we look to do uh, because we land across sector, across geography, um, uh, and are really trying to translate the capital markets to understand the needs of communities, um, really trying to see how we can better position, um, market, and, and show the incredible work that CDFIs are doing um, as a part of the solution as people think about broader 
um, kind of the next generation of, of investments and broader uh, stakeholder capitalism uh, movements. Uh, and there's no reason why the CDFI industry should not be uh, front and center in that conversation. Um, you know, I think everybody is looking to, um, to activate their dollars, to activate their decisions, to activate their time and their work um, in pursuit of a more equitable and sustainable world. And I think that, uh, you know, the, the work that CDFIs do on the ground in communities every day um, is a perfect example of that. And so, as Kat mentioned, you know, uh, love the call to action, get more money to these people faster. Um, uh, certainly want to be doing that. As Michael mentioned, think differently about scale um, and, and think about, you know, how to, to channel capital. And I think I'll just add, just wanting to make sure that we look at the full investor universe, we look at the full scale and scope and power of the capital markets and understand how we can create the financial structures and infrastructure to get a dollar that sits in the savings account or the retirement account of a teacher um, to support uh, the work of ACE uh, and BBIF and, uh, and True Fund and uh, Communities Unlimited and all the other incredible CDFIs across the country. Um, thank you. Those are, those are really important points. And I think what it makes me want to hear from each of you about, which I, I know we talked about a little bit, was like, what's your, give us a solution. Like, give us something that you can inject into this system or that you're working on injecting or you've seen or you've, you've thought about injecting into the system that you think is really going to be a difference maker. Uh, and name and name its terms. You know, name its 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 skeleton. Like whatever you can about its specificity. Uh, I'd love I'd love to just see your best thought on that. Um, and I don't know. How about uh, Beth? Why don't you start since we were we were just on you to really get you off off back on your heels. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, dusting off. Um, uh, so yeah, so so one of the things, so we've been lending to CDFIs for 25 years. So we uh, we know them, we love them. Um, we have seen their evolution over the last uh, 25 years plus, and um, and we know the the limitations of the structure um, that a lot of them sit in. So one of the things that we started to do when COVID hit, um, basically in close coordination with a bunch of the uh, of CDFIs that we have been lending to for a long time, we said, you know, we are in a moment where demand for capital from small businesses is going to vastly outpace supply of capital available on CDFI balance sheets. Um, it's just a fact to the, the slide that Tim put up earlier, um, right, the CDFI balance sheets, particularly the loan funds, um, are, you know, are, are, are limited in their scale and uh, and they uh, require equity in the form of grants to 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 uh, to scale their work. And so pulling all of that together very quickly is difficult. And so how do we bridge this this divide between supply and demand? Um, so we created in close partnership with our with friends at Community Reinvestment Fund and LISC and others created this kind of concept of a community recovery vehicle which is essentially, uh, I, there was just an article that came out this morning, they called it securitization plus blended finance equals impact, um, which is a good tagline for it. But essentially it's a secondary market vehicle that purchases uh, locally originated assets from CDFIs, a standardized loan product uh, that they are then able to sell to the SPV. It brings centralized source of capital, centralized leads, and uh, a support system of technical assistance providers to a network of community development financial institutions across a certain place so that they have everything that they need to, uh, to lean into this moment and, and do new lending to small businesses to bridge that divide between supply and demand. So we set up the first up and running now. We're now replicating that across California and across uh, 13 states in the South. And all in, I think, working with 35 the um, local CDFI, um, local nonprofit loan funds uh, to implement the work. So really just try, trying to set up structures to support them so they can lean into this moment and, and think about economic recovery for the community. Mm -hmm. Kat, how about you? What are you working on? Say, I'm a huge supporter of what Beth and the team are doing. 
incredible opportunity for the industry as we think about specifically place-based um, opportunities for CDFIs um, to access. Um, yeah, I think we think again, uh, I would say two main um, areas that we're really trying to push on to unlock more capital. And again, the theme for us is how do we use technology to unlock a lot more capital for CDFIs? And I'll stress what's important for us at CNOTE is it's gotta be money CDFIs want, right? Where is the patient capital? Where is the low cost debt? Where is the capital that's serving the needs that community has? Not what we as investors think is important. And that's a real shift in power and trust that we're trying to advocate for that is not about what we think is important. It's about what that community needs right now. And so we do think that by incorporating community voices and using technology to facilitate, we can make it more transparent, more unbiased, and faster and cheaper for everybody. So the two ways we do it right now that we're really um, pushing for, one is unlocking deposits. I'll talk about the importance of shifting large deposits into CDFI banks and credit unions. And so we're doing that through our Promise account, which again, uses the use all that friction of opening up 12 accounts or having to work with a bank that may not even be open for business right now, but is still open for deposits. How do we get those deposits into where they're needed in the CDFI community? That's on the CDFI deposit. And then on the CDFI loan, loan fund side, again, it's using technology to unlock the friction around getting any investor. So again, whether you're a foundation who has never worked with a CDFI and don't, doesn't even know where to start, whether you've been working with CDFIs for years, but no longer have your team at full capacity to underwrite them, or whether you're just trying to figure out how to create supports a certain cause like racial justice, things we can do um, through the power of technology. So I think we're clearly bullish on this is an asset class and an industry that deserves to be funded to new levels. And a lot of those reasons why not are no longer. And so we're excited to just introduce more and more of that infrastructure to the industry and to investors to make it happen. Great, Michael, what, uh, what would you put forward? Yeah, so <clears throat> before we, we um, we'll do a little under a billion dollars this year, uh, lending to CDFIs and uh, nonprofits. Um, mostly because in response to our high net worth uh, clients on separate account, they said, look, we have several billion dollars in aggregate um, in muni bonds, tax exempt, tax free bonds that are not earning much interest. Um, and given the pandemic are pretty risky. How can we think differently about into CDFIs, nonprofits, and others. Well, there are a number of existing mechanisms that are just poorly used to get tax exempt, tax free capital at scale um, to those organizations. Um, so we have several tools, one of which is the 501c3 bond. So we credit enhance um, our nonprofits so that um, on aggregate, credit risk is alert to other credit risks for other securities that sit in our clients' portfolios. Um, we have to do some things like change the duration, I think, um, meaning um, typically uh, our investors will have um, municipal bonds that have a three to four year duration. We'd like to see the money in there for 12 years or longer, sometimes 15 years, sometimes 30 years, because again, patient capital is so critical. So we work a lot of times with their uh, fixed income advisors to help adjust the duration of the entire portfolio such that we can pool together, similar to what Beth and Ken are doing, large portfolios of projects uh, and then create a special purpose vehicle, which would be a nonprofit, and then give that nonprofit access to capital that's below 2%. So, um, and that's really our, our, we're piloting that now with um, about 30 families. Um, I think next year we're gonna bring another 50 or 60 families on board. And the idea really is to tap into market-based low-cost capital, uh, really using the tools that I think we're all kind of playing with on the edges, securitization, less friction, less underwriting, less fees, better use of technology. Um, I think all those tools have to come into play so that we can really reduce the cost. When you're talking about such low-cost capital, you need a lot of volume for it to be profitable for intermediaries or other people trying to pull these things together and actually have a business and make it work. So. Scale begets scale, uh, and you know, uh, I find that our first question, which works all the time, we sit down with one of our prospective clients is, how much are you making in your munis and your treasuries right now? <laughs> and they're all gonna laugh and look at it. And think, Believe it or not, most people think 
uh, ultra high net worth families are, are primarily invested in the stock market. They're not. Most of their money is in preservation assets um, like municipal bonds and treasuries. And so they'll have 60, right. 70% of their capital in income. Uh, and so the vast majority of their wealth is really earning a very small return. And so the question is, well, if you weren't concerned about the credit risk, would you rather make more money and have impact? Uh, and then if you're playing in a bigger bucket of capital, you can just deploy more capital. So, um, you know, and I, that's something I would encourage everyone to do. You know, every every county basically has the ability to issue a 501c3 bond um, and other tax exempt uh, structures. Um, and so, you know, in general, that's just one tool. We have four or five structures, opportunity zone, equity, very small amounts of that is something that we like to put in the CDFI. Uh, structures as well, nonprofits as well, um, because it's 10 year capital, it's extremely patient, um, and it provides kind of a recoverable grant uh, or credit support to the primary um, uh, tax exempt loan product that we have. Um, so um, every situation is bespoke, but we're, you know, kind of sophisticated investment bankers really looking to move um, very large capital um, into these uh, communities. Great. Uh, Greg, have is there something you've seen or something percolating over there at rockefeller foundation or you know some 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 model that you uh, are in, enticed by at this point or yeah i mean I, I guess i'll just say that in our experience we tend to find that place-based approaches to directing capital tend to be successful at driving racial justice outcomes because that's what we're talking about uh, black and Latinx and native and indigenous communities who have been disproportionately affected um, and how to get them the resources they need. We find that three things need to be true in order to do that successfully. One is that we align that capital with the appropriate and often alternative structure. The second is that we attach it to something that ensures absor absorption capacity and additionality. And the third thing is just that it ensures distributed wealth creation rather than replication of the current patterns and systems that are currently in place. And so where we are making investments in CDFIs and we aren't quite ready to announce what the, R, the, the initial grants in the ROC portfolio, so I can't talk ex explicitly about them, but where we have put dollars out there, it's largely risk capital to support and strengthen the institutions and their balance sheets. So whether they're looking to make direct investments to strengthen balance sheets for existing institutions or whether they're concessionary debt instruments, um, you know, that's that's how we're putting dollars on the ground. The other thing that I'll just say that where we're really putting our dollars behind CDFIs and the like um, uh, is behind this urgent need for innovation and in products and financial mm -hmm. instruments and structures that are actually more responsive to the needs of Black and Latinx and other people and communities of color. So when we think about the typical loan amounts that they need, when we think about the typical type of loan products or, or financial products that they need, um, the traditional institutions, and in many regards, CDFIs don't have the type, types of products that are necessary to meet their needs. So in the CDFI space and in the other in the universe of other options, we're really pushing and using our dollars to push for what are the innovative models that really allow banking and financial capital providers to serve, better serve Black and Latinx and low wealth communities across the country. That's great. I was just catching a question from Blake, uh, what, are, what our thoughts are on building equity in CDFIs and actually the, the thing I was thinking about as far as an interesting model that we've run across and impact assets, actually this was with Calvert Impact Capital. Um, we took, we embedded in our community investment portfolios that all of our donor advised funds can kind of click into, if you will, um, uh, a $15 million special purpose vehicle with Calvert Impact Capital is the GP. We're the sole limited partner. It's technically an equity vehicle. And because the GP has control, FASB accounting rules allow them to actually incorporate it as net assets into their balance sheet, into their audited statements. So it actually reads optically, I mean, that doesn't in and of itself necessarily do anything, optically as equity from a tactical standpoint, but then the real work is assessing how to allow it to actually enhance the capital stack. And what we did was kind of put it in, not, not, not at first loss, but above loss reserves and kind of par pursue with, with, a, with a tier two capital uh, that that Calvert has in its balance sheet. And so we were effectively both optically, technically, accounting wise, and functionally able to risk enhance with an equity like 
capital, uh, much more effective than EQ2s from CRI banks, I think. Um, a, a pretty significant chunk, because not only is that 15 million going out into communities through CFIs across the country, um, but it's also leveraging from the capital markets, um, you know, from these DTs, uh, these, these QCIP notes that people can hold in their brokerage accounts that are Calvert senior stack, senior part of the stack, like $100 million, because their ratio is seven to one, right? So that's, I mean, that I think that's pretty cool. And now there's issues about replicating that. Like, you really need to do it at scale because it's a pain in the butt um, to do all the technical stuff that I was just kind of glossing over like it was all fun and games. Um, but uh, but I, uh, I was really excited to be able to leverage donor advised funds um, that are kind of left to their own devices, somewhat passive mattress money waiting to go out to grants to their favorite charity. And we can really activate that, um, which uh, I guess to my next question, speed dial or uh, lightning round. What's the, oh, sorry, go ahead, Beth, since I was talking about you. I just, I just wanted to note to the equity question, because I think it's a really, really important one. Um, equity capital is so important um, for both uh, for-profit CDFI banks and holding companies, as well as uh, nonprofit loan funds. Obviously, the structure, based on what Tim just, just described, has to be different depending on the structure of the, the entity. Uh, not enough, like that is critical for uh, these organizations scale. Um, and, and Lori Spangler and, and George Surgeon did some really great work um, putting out their lessons in raising tier one capital for Southern Bank Corp um, because uh, they recently did a, a, a growth push for Southern so that they could kind of um, clean up and, uh, and, and infuse new sources of tier one capital so that they could continue to grow. But one of the things I think uh, I'm a little fearful of right in this moment is that so many people are shifting deposits into CDFI banks, which is awesome, um, but deposits to them are liabilities and they're not equity. And so wanting to make sure that as we think about global solutions to scaling this industry, um, we think about solutions, whether that's through the federal government, uh, state governments, or, or private investors, but make sure we keep kind of that equity need front and center because otherwise none of, none of the rest of this. Yeah, yeah. Robert, just quickly, uh, we're doing one of the things that we're doing is we are um, making to uh, some of our CDFI partners and then our firm is taking on the responsibility to pay those back as recoverable. So technically it's a recoverable grant because that's how it functions in our waterfall, but we separate the payment obligation from the CDFI and we take that on uh, internally so that it sits on their balance sheet as uh, equity capital. Um, but the investor still um, makes sort of a zero coupon return. Yeah, and I was just going to add, takeaway I'd love everyone listening to say is, please be open when we have these conversations with you, because I think these are all such important points, and um, we can't keep shifting to debt without balancing it out with equity. So as we talk about ways to really bolster CDFIs, what do is come to you with both opportunities, not just one, not just two, but right, the entire package of what's really sustainable sustainability for those CDFIs um, and a couple structures um, we have a vehicle response fund which is a debt instrument it's it's one percent five-year capital a hundred percent co-created with CDFIs for what they thought the communities needed most right now it cannot function at scale without equal equity right and so all of us stepping into that reality and being open to those conversations is, is my invitation That's great. And I was just reminding myself and I just posted it uh, that we're going to be able to jump over to the impact assets uh, session booth at half past the hour and just really kind of go deep on anywhere that people who want to follow us over there want to go and we'll stay for, you know, 20 minutes, 30, 40 minutes if we if we have the energy. So I just posted a link in there, but it's just over at the event, event expo thing. So that's just a piece of housekeeping. Um, what what about what's missing? Uh, not the the solution idea, you know, or, or the, the ingredients that you just talked about, because obviously you just you put those forwards, but like, is there something in the system that we, you know, I saw questions uh, from, I think it was uh, Doug around suitability, uh, you know, changing suitability requirements. So non-accredited investors could invest in their local community loan fund legally um, it, or, or whatever it is, like what's the missing ingredient from at a policy level at a, I mean, not like, the heart of capitalism, because that we all know that it's pretty 
rancid at its heart in some ways, or we'll have a varying opinions about that. And some people don't think that's the case at all. But what would you change? Um, Greg, what would you change? Sure. So I'll tackle these quickly in the interest of time. Um, I just think that at, at a federal level, we have to begin to think about centering people rather than profit, right? So how do we begin to put community interest before self-interest, um, whether that's the Community Reinvestment Act or any other piece of legislation or policy that's going to have a critical impact on the ability to get dollars into the hands or not into the hands of Black and Latinx uh, and indigenous populations of people that we really do have to think about that. Um, and then I just think that in a more in a in a less practical sense, rather than thinking about the policy ramifications and the definite need for more equity dollars, is that we have to. I'm going to go back to the urgent need for innovation in the CDFI space, right? So some of it is that we need to have some some policy change or shift. Some of it is that we need to have practice change and practice shift, um, and that needs to be balanced between the sense of practicality and the breadth of imagination. Um, I know that it's possible. There are CDFIs again that we've referenced on this call. There are models, innovative models that people have talked about on this call that are representative of what is possible. I think that we need more of that. We need to incentivize that. We need to figure out which parts of it are scalable um, and get to the job, get, get to the job of getting it done. That's great. Kat, what would you do? What would you change? Where do I start? Um, I one thing. Yeah, one thing. Oh, just Okay, two, two, two. You can have a two. Two things. I'm going to do one more philosophical, one, one deeply practical. Um, you know, so one at at large would be just democratization of this, right? And I think democratization, as you alluded to, Tim, which is how do we make it accessible for everybody to invest in their backyard, invest in their communities, invest in economic justice, not just um, high net worth institutions. Um, and then make sure that democratization rolls out in terms of who those dollars go to, because the lion's share of dollars are still going to the largest organizations, and some of the deepest work is happening in smaller organizations. So the democratization piece, I would say, more philosophically. And then pragmatically, I would say, and this is my soapbox, moving to action. How do we make it insanely easy for every single one of us to do this? whether it's through our you know, bank account, whether it's through our you know, foundation, whether it's through our endowment, whatever pot of money we're sitting on from an investment, right? How do we make it very easy for us to say yes and step into this? And not just from a one-off, right? Like let's do it now in the middle of the pandemic and feel good, but literally invest in the long-term, make it this part, institutionalized part of how we think about investing. That to me is a fundamental shift in terms of seeing CDFIs as a potential remedy when we're at our worst and they're economic first responders to a viable, critical under, underpinning of our economy, uh, that we have more economic justice that all of us are investing in in the long term. Beth, what do you think? Is your yeah, I'll, I'll be quick. I'm gonna use my, my three T's, um, talent, tech, and talk. Um, and I really just talk is because I, Oh, I couldn't think of another T. Uh, but but <laughs> talent, I mean, I think one of the things that we we don't talk about enough is going to scale the CDFI industry, if we're going to scale this work in communities, um, we have to drive uh, talent to those organizations and get people paid better um, and uh, and you know, uh, get the, the best, best and brightest working in these organizations. I think we're seeing that more and more uh, with MBA programs and other grad programs focused on this intersection. I think we're seeing awesome people uh, driving real change in CDFIs, but we got to focus on, on talent. Um, technology is, is systems to scale. I mean, I think we've, we've gone through the really, really uh, hard and arduous process in the last three years to uh, update all of our systems so that we are much more scalable and efficient uh, organization. And, and we just have to we have to get the money to invest to allow people to invest in technology. One of the reasons why small companies struggle uh, it, uh, more broadly is because the cost of technology and IT systems and all of that is is just so expensive. And so we got to invest in in tech. And then is really marketing. So uh, the 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 the. CDFI industry has done a pretty poor job because they haven't had any money to do it um, in marketing themselves in the industry, who they are, what they do, how they help, and how, like Kat mentioned, how you can engage. Um, and I think you know we need a we need a, a broad public campaign, more awareness, more understanding of 
uh, of the role of, of this grassroots financial um, kind of infrastructure so that we see more money moving um, and, and more people served. That's great. Michael, what would you change? Well, policy. Everyone sort of spoke to the main things that I would focus on, democratization, talent and technology. Um, but, but primarily, I, I think the, the key um, issue is just access. Um, and and, and to, to speak to, to the, the point about um, retail investors getting more activated or high net worth investors, just, just having more broad access and awareness um, to this product because um, I think primarily it's a very low risk group of lending um, and equity. And I think it's it great. I would massively fund the CFI fund and create some kind of an equity carrot, you know, vanguard position that all of philanthropy would be uh, uh, sticked in the following, <laughs> like, a, like a, a, a sort of a trillion dollar mandate to like move all those idle assets in endowments and donor advised funds for that matter. Um, there's about a trillion between foundations and, and, uh, and if we had it sort of a center of gravity, maybe Fran over at US Impact Investing Alliance could work on this inside the beltway. Um, something there, something to really go at a national mandate and facilitation of equity-like capital, because as you've all said quite eloquently, that's you know, that's one of the major, major frictions. So um, we're gonna run out of time in just well, you know, five minutes um, or so. Uh, I know there were some questions about suitability. I don't know if we're gonna, I think we'll take those with us to the, um, to the uh, after party, which I encourage everybody to come join us if you would like, we can really take some time and bring people up on screen and talk about it. But uh, just in close out for people who aren't coming over and um, I'd love to hear from each of you a call to action. I mean, if, if and it, it could be for any sub-segment of the audience. I know SOCAP is a, is a bit of a kitchen sink of amazingness uh, in terms of who the heck comes to these things. Uh, and there's 84 different answers to um, how many uh, different sorts of folks are, are eyeballing us right now, but what would you, what would you say to, to them, uh, or, or why don't you say it, uh, Kat? What, what's what's the call to action? And it you know it could be specific or general, but go for it. Advocate if you don't know the CDFI industry and you're just learning about it, please. Um, there are so many great resources, including um, OFN Opportunity Finance Network, um, to learn about the. Industry. Um, invest. There are so many great ways right now. You've heard a couple today, um, and I think um, Calvert, C Note, and Rockefeller, um, Michael's Group. There's so many great avenues. And then, of course, through your donor advised fund. And, and I want to stress that I think DAF is a tremendous opportunity to engage the CDFI sector through great DAFs like Impact Assets. And last is Advocate. If you are already educated around it, you're already invested, let's advocate for those big wins like Tim's referencing to really make this a sustainable part of our economy, not just a small segment that only a few people know about. That's great. Um, Michael, what's your call to action? I would, I would add just one one eye to what Kat just said, which is imagination. Um, once you sort of uh, advocate, get to the point of advocacy, really uh, imagine uh, new ways and tools um, for people like myself and others um, to push more capital um, and more intentionality into this. Greg? Sure. So what the expert said. Uh, and <laughs> a little bit investigate. Uh, educate, negotiate, and demonstrate. Uh, there's a very real need for patient capital. We have to deal with the equity issue. Um, and ultimately, this won't get done unless we do it intentionally and specifically uh, to the benefit of the express communities that we've called out for this afternoon's panel. So let's get to the work of doing it. That's great. I mean, I think uh, I think that, that it covers all of the best things that you could do other than, I mean, I guess I would say our sphere of concern, you know, our sphere of influence, it is so easy to, to forget how relationships drive 
capital and and there's a lot of bad in that and there's but there's also a lot of power in that and so uh don't underestimate you and your sphere of concern and relationships and how you can activate people by not just walking the talk and having your own story straight but really really challenge and push uh your family and you know and your organizations to find the way to step into this you know this incredibly important gap and also this opportunity to i think take what is bones of a great system and turning it into one that can really scale uh into the kind of recovery and resilience building we're going to need over the next if not months years years uh and also firmly and focus in on on communities of people of color that are been frozen out of the system that we're uh, all in our ways maybe still supporting um so get get aligned get out there, turn, uh, get out the vote. <laughs> and also don't forget to vote, by the way. Uh, so we're gonna pop over to, um, I think to our um, uh, our after party booth, which I just posted again. Um, and the, uh, I think that it would be great if people can come over there and we'll, we'll keep talking for a bit. I wanna think, I'm, I'm sorry that we lost Beth again to technical difficulties. Um, I think her computer acted up. I'm not sure what her call to action would have been, um, but I bet it was well represented somewhere in something that you just heard. And thank you so much for being here and, um, and listening and thinking about CDFIs. They really are an amazing, amazing system that we have, I think, really not yet activated fully at all. And we really can. Oh, Beth, what's your what's your last call to action? That, we just got you in time. Um, I'll let you close us out. What 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 do you want people to do? Uh, invest every dollar you have. Uh, <laughs> invest in C note. Invest in uh, invest in uh, our community investment node. Invest in your local CDFIs, and then move your money. Um, take your bank account wherever it's sitting. Uh, move it into your local CDFI bank. Uh, we did it. We are our, our all of our business and checking accounts are with. Uh, City First Bank in DC, and we we love them. So um, just think think for assets at your disposal, and and do something about it. Thanks. Okay, bye everybody. Thank you for watching, and uh, maybe we'll see you over at the other room if we can find our way there. You just go to Expo and then click on Impact Assets, and you'll probably run right into us. See you soon. See you around the, the SoCal. <laughs>